So good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for being here for this very exciting evening with authors Penny Kittle and Kelly Gallagher. If everyone could just turn their cameras off and mute their videos for the session, that would be wonderful. Um, you can use the hashtag uh, OCSB 180 days tonight to tweet your learning and enter to win a diverse text. Winners will be emailed uh, at a later date. We won't announce them tonight. As you know, this duo is known for being international gurus of literacy <laughs> and teachers of stories. So I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the many stories that have been told on this land long before settlers arrived. These stories were both oral and written and were passed or were used to pass along histories and traditions that still exist on this unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Algonquin peoples. We're gonna begin by centering ourselves in prayer tonight. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, help us to focus on what we have, not on what is removed or changed. Strengthen us when we feel discouraged or overwhelmed. Embrace us so that we know your loving presence within us and among us. Walk with us as we bring your love and carry your light into our world, amen. It is an honor and a privilege to introduce the co-authors of our virtual book club text, 180 Days. Penny Kittle teaches freshman composition in Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. She was, I'm a gonna teacher. Be Kittle. she was a teacher and literacy coach for 34 years. She is the author of Book Love and Right Beside Them, which won the James Britton Award. She is the president of the Book Love Foundation and was given the Exemplary Leader Award from the National Council of English Teachers Conference on English Leadership. In the summer, Penny teaches graduate students at the University of New Hampshire Literacy Institute. She is a passionate advocate when it comes to empowering students through independence and literacy. She believes in curiosity, engagement, and deep thinking in schools for both students and teachers. Kelly Gallagher is coming to us from Anaheim, California, where he is a retired, a newly retired, high school ELA teacher of 35 years. He also continues to be an author and consultant who works with educators around the world. Kelly has led several literacy programs, including the California Reading and Literature Project, the South Basin Writing Project at California State University, and the Puente Project, um, a University of California outreach program that prepares underrepresented high school students for transition into universities. He has served as a professor at California State University and um, as the president of Secondary Reading Group at the International Reading Association. Kelly has written numerous books for teachers such as Teaching Adolescent Writers, Deep Reading and Read Aside. And these are just some of the many that have guided our literacy practices here at the Ottawa Catholic School Board. Penny and Kelly, we are huge fans of your work here at the Ottawa Catholic School Board, and we have some very excited educators here tonight. So with no further ado, I hand this over to you. Oh, thank you so Yay. much. It is wonderful thank to be you, with Aaron. you all. <laughs> thank you all, very, very nice to be here, especially probably since most of you worked today uh, oh my to come home and, and then come in, in the evening. This is... Uh, these professional teachers who are with us tonight, Penny. Absolutely. I always say that the, the most impressive people I meet on the road are often from Canada. I don't know what it is about your whole like uh, thinking about education, but I'm always inspired when I'm with you. And I have to say that the thing that I really wish was that tonight we were in Ottawa beautiful Ottawa. It's probably snowy and freezing cold like it is here. Um, I live exactly five hours from you. So I am often there. Okay, now I got a little problem because everybody who comes in at this point, I have to admit somehow, sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to have to go back and forth until I've admitted everybody. Oh. So welcome. Thank you. Welcome. <laughs> Um, so we're going to share some thinking tonight. First of all, as Kelly said, uh, a teacher in Detroit told us this winter or this fall, I'm April tired and it's only October. 
That was my <laughs> class this fall. And you can see their um, thrilled faces. Oh my word, thank heavens we have Miss Kettle as our teacher. Um, I'm with you. It is, it is tough sledding to put them all online and try to have meaningful conversations in book clubs and writing groups. I worked at it. Um, I have never been more tired. So huge respect to all of you for putting in time tonight. Um, I'm going to pop out because I got two more people in the waiting room. Sorry. Um, I would say that I'm all five hours away, but my five hours is not in a car. Uh, <laughs> I, I love, love, love going to Canada anytime I can. And it's a great, a great country. I don't care what province I'm in. I always, always want to come back. Um, yeah, absolutely. We, to talk about this idea that you know we're work you're working in a very very difficult situation right now of a pandemic and you know professional talk in this one no. making promises that things are going to be easy but I think you know things are hard right now and so what we'd like to do is maybe spend this hour with you we're going to split the time in half and maybe talk a little bit on the hour about kids up and writing and in the half hour, we're going to flip and, and talk uh, more about the reading world. So first, a uh, big idea uh, is this idea is how do we get students engaged in, in writing more? Uh, that it is all about the reps. It's about getting kids up and going. We list these five everyday practices that um, are aspirational. We try very hard to do all five of these in our class every single day. But um, uh, and most days were successful. But um, today, in the first half hour, we're going to really, really shift to the writing side. Don um, said, "Kelly, the writing Kelly, can I? Yeah, who, go ahead. Todd, can you be a co-host? Because every time somebody comes in, I got to let them in. And if you could run it from your end, I wouldn't have to keep dropping out of the slideshow. Are you a co-host right now? Sorry, you guys. Just got to try this technical difficulty." You know what I'm talking um, about? I know what you're talking about. Hold on. Let me, yeah, if you come out for a second, I can do that. Um, okay, I'm going to make you the host. Okay. Can you do that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm, it's just that I, every time I start a slide, it goes admit me, and I don't want people waiting in the waiting room. Yeah, I'll do that. Okay, the so now you need to... When you, when you do your whole screen, I lose ability to see that. To see what? To see who needs to be admitted. No, I will still be admitting, I believe, as a co-host. Okay. Sorry. Or you want me to do it? Um, I just want you to advance the slides. Can you go to your slideshow, share your screen? Yeah. Okay, because then I could continue to admit people. Uh, I don't have slideshow up though. <laughs> hey, do you want to try to make me a co-host and I can um, see if I can do all of this and mute the participants or move the slides along? Okay, Is there any so that? I'm going to reclaim my host. The problem is they won't let me co-host. I either oh. have to make you host or make me host. So you guys... We really, we have done this before. We, I feel like we're doing <laughs> it right now. <laughs> but I'm going to keep going and I'll just pop out and admit people if it happens again. So um, as Kelly was starting to say there, um, we both were impacted by Don Graves' work. And more than anything, Don taught me that if I was writing what my students were writing, if I was in the process of writing continually, even if I don't get to a best draft, that that modeled for students why anyone would write at all. Like, what is it about writing that makes me want to get up tomorrow morning? I actually have a list of two things that I need to write tomorrow morning. And what makes me, what makes me driven to do that? So we thought that the best thing we could do is plan a little bit for all of us to write together. Did you want to go so ahead, Kelly? So uh, we, you know, this idea that kids should be doing a lot of what we, we believe is low pressure, ungraded writing daily in the classroom. A lot of writing that the teacher does not necessarily see. 
kids to play a lot of piano before they play the piano. And so we want to have daily writing conditions. So that place, that that writer's notebook is a place to work. You'll see in Penny's class there. Yeah, that's my, I'm under the document camera so they can see my notebook right behind me on the screen and they're revising. Place to collect ideas and to share some thinking and a place to play, a place to, to experiment, a place to take risks and, and not worry about whether it's the best thing they've ever produced or not. Uh, Penny and I believe very strongly in, in a lot of, you know, we bring in seeds that we think will spur uh, kids to, to want to write. Uh, and this is more of a generative approach. It does not look at this poem and answer four questions or look at this YouTube video and answer the teacher's questions. It's more along the lines of looking at something that we think will, will spur kids to write and uh, will get them to embrace the blank page. Which is a challenge, I think, really a challenge at the start of the year. And this year being online, I kept thinking, you know, my, are my students with me? Are you guys all writing? And I'm gonna show you a little bit about how I got a chance to look at their notebooks. Cause we both really believe in um, handwriting in notebooks as a balance to all the typing that they do outside of class. So we thought we would do a little bit of writing um, with you. And so we hope you all have a place to write. Of course, since we can't tell, um, you could be <laughs> writing in a notebook or writing on your computer. We hope you will write with us um, because we're gonna look at a text together, something that I did with my class this fall, this exact text and what that process looked like. Because I find that if I were just to say, um, will you guys all do some writing? I would get this, you know, like, how do I start? What do I do? And so I've always believed that what Linda Reef calls quick writes um, can really change a classroom and change their ability to write on demand. So in my classroom this fall, we studied a piece of writing that was written um, last June by Mitchell Jackson for Runner's World. And it's about the murder of Ahmaud Arbery on the streets, um, the suburbs of Atlanta. And what I've highlighted for you are phrases. This is what I call a tribute, or it's an informational essay, but it's also a tribute to him written by um, um, this journalist who interviewed all of his family. And so he begins with, on February 23rd, 2020, a young man out for a run was lynched in Glynn County, Georgia. His name was Ahmad Marquez Arbery, called Kez by his beloveds and Maude by most others. And what I want you to know about Maude is that he had a gift for impressions and a special knack for mimicking Martin Lawrence. What I want you to know about Maude is he had a fondness for sweets and requested his mother's fudge cake. This repeating rhythm, what I want you to know and what I want you to know changes over the course of the essay. So my students come to class having read it, but now I'm highlighting the way we might imitate it and transform it. Because after he said several things, what I want you to know, he says, you should know that Maude dreamed of a career as an electrician and of owning a construction company. You should know he told his boys, he wanted them all to buy a huge plot of land, build houses on it. And then what you must know about Maude turns into a Maude was more than a viral video, more than a hashtag, a name on a list of tragic victims more than an article, doubtless was more than our likes or emoji tears or hearts or praying hands. He for damn sure was more than the latest reason for your liberal white friends ephemeral outrage, more than a rally or a march, more than a symbol, more than a movement, more than a cause, he was loved. So I had my students um, on the page go back and just write those phrases, what I want you to know, and then to skip several lines and, you know, like a paragraph's worth and look at the next repeating pattern, you should know. And of course my kids by this point are saying, but what are we writing about? Do we have to write about a mod? <laughs> what you must know is the third one. And of course I said, no, you're gonna choose something that matters to you, something you wanna pay tribute to, or perhaps um, something you've lost. 
blank was more than. And you can see that that even changes to for damn sure was more than he was loved. So um, students started saying, well, could I write about my coach? Because they were new to the university, my hockey coach for four years, of course, but he hasn't died. He doesn't have to die, right? You can say, what I want you to know about my hockey coach was, and um, could I write about my lacrosse stick? Joe asked me, of course you can. So I want this to be that open for you, just like it was for my students. And we're gonna write for just three or four minutes, right, Kelly? Yep, three. three and what are, you, what are you writing about? Well, I jotted down, uh, reminds me of my father. So uh, I've, I've already bulleted a couple of things of what I want you to know about him. And so I'm gonna see where that takes me. Nice, nice. All right, we're gonna write together for three, four minutes and we'll come back. You ready to come to yeah. a pause? Take a moment to finish the line you're working on. One of the things I think is really important is, you know, we don't just assign writing. We do the writing alongside our kids. We do the writing in front of them. And it's the thinking that we do and the, the insight that we offer our kids about our own process. Uh, that it become really, really valuable. And whenever I work with Penny in a workshop, I like to ask her, you know, where did this quick write take you? And what were you thinking as you were creating that? 
So um, I wrote about Julius, my corgi, <laughs> and um, he's in the running to be my favorite dog of all time, which would take some work to beat out Mishka the Malamute. So um, I just started listing all the things that I uh, love about this dog who is sitting right outside my office, as he always does when I'm on Zoom. What did you write about? I, as I was thinking about my dad, I landed on this line. Uh, I want you to know that his distance did not mean he was distant. Uh, line, I don't even know where that came from. And so I started to explore, you know, why he was, he was, he was a loving father, but not outwardly. So, uh, right. and I, I started to delve into like, history and his trauma that he had from fighting in World War II to being abandoned as a young boy uh, by his parents. Um, I don't know. It's when uh, a serious place. Uh, I, I, I think what's interesting, though, is I got about halfway through it and I realized, you know, I only wrote a paragraph or two, but I, I realized uh, there's one direction I was thinking I head into it and then I decided, no, that's not the way I want to go. And so I want to Think coming to it and making it. There's one element. There was one trauma that I mentioned. I think actually is something I want to come back and write about. Hmm. Wow. Thank you. I think that one thing I think is really interesting about um, this quick writing process with kids is that I'm very public with them over what happens to me in my writing. And so this fall, when I did it with them. I started writing about my father and I only got this far in the few minutes because I realized I needed to kind of give you a little bit before I went into what I want you to know. And that writing, I went back to just recently. Um, and so what I would highlight for kids is not only that I tend to kind of write all over the page and find things that connect and pretty soon I'm adding things in in different places and you know but you can see that i'm following the same thinking that you saw um happen in mitchell jackson's piece but what surprised me and i think we have to be public with kids about the things that surprise us as writers because that's what keeps us coming back is that all of a sudden i heard this line you know you should know my dad saw my mom he knew what he was asking pleading with me as they rushed him down the hall to the second emergency surgery to ask me to carry what he had been carrying to take care of her and all of a sudden i could hear and what i hope he knows is that i was faithful to that promise and i hadn't expected it to go that way and i have this habit of turning my notebook sideways when i'm writing something that's really difficult i don't know what that is um, but I just show my students that I, I tend to, I just need it to be separate for some reason. Um, but I think that's the, the process of being real writers is that volume matters. Kelly and I write almost every day. And, and the book that we finished last week, we, it kind of sustained us through this last year of the pandemic because we wrote almost every morning together working on this project and choice matters. Kelly, you're writing about your dad. Tonight, I wanted to write about Julius. When I did it before, I wanted to write about my dad. So more than anything, the voices of our students matter. So in finding a place in school where kids uh, have, a, have a place to tell their stories, which we think is particularly important for kids who come from historically presented or you know, don't have that their stories are not traditionally found in the curriculum, right? So we, we love Goldie Muhammad's book, Cult of a Genius, in which she talks about historically responsibilities call for urgent pedagogies. We, we think for a lot of the kids that we work with, writing is an urgent pedagogy because they're not doing it. Uh, and to get them to do it is to let them tell the stories that only they can tell. And that's such a key moment for me to say to a kid, you know, there's stories you can tell that nobody can tell but you. What are they, you know? And you don't have to share them with me, but I think that poetry leads them to these incredible stories. And so we bring in texts that are mirrors for our kids, that are windows and sliding glass doors, as um, Rudine Sims Bishop said, that 
we want our kids to be seen in the works that we present in front of them. So we give a, a range of titles, but we also think that poetry ignites within kids. Um, it's something about the intensity of the lines that gets them wanting to respond. And can I say that this use of poetry is very different than traditional use of poetry in a lot of English classrooms. In a lot of English classrooms, it's, you know, what Billy Collins said, is to tie that poem to a chair and try to beat a confession out of it. That's not what we're doing here. We're using a poem here as a launch pad uh, to have kids write about things that they're very interested in writing about. Yeah, absolutely. And so this year, being online, um, I had to figure out a way to see their notebooks. And I never was in the room with my students because I was not on campus. And I decided I was asked them to do a notebook tour so that they could show me what they had been doing. Now, during the semester, they had sent me um, photographs of the pages they were working on in their notebooks. Not all of them, just um, one or two each time that um, I met with them. And so the, um, the tours they sent, I have condensed down to these short little snippets. And so I just wanna show you three little glimpses into what kids said about this notebook writing and its importance. I heard the audio on that, Penny. Hold it, what? I did not hear the audio coming from that. Uh oh, do you guys not have the audio when that was playing? <sighs> okay, we're gonna. What if I don't have my headphones in? But it always seems to work, but we'll see this time, all right? Try it again. Can you hear you it? No, first things I noticed was yes. with my notebook was just, I was only, you know, five or so pages away from filling it all the way, which was a pretty big accomplishment for me. Uh, I've never written that much for a class in my life. So I think that was definitely a step in the right direction. I think so as well, right? More matters. The more you write, um, the more comfortable you get, the more confident. Here's Mitzi. And, oh, this one was called Who Gets to Be Afraid in America? Oh, no, sorry, that's not what it's called, but that's where it's from. <laughs> um, I called it Self-Identity Crisis. Um, so it goes, who am I? What am I supposed to be? I'm either too white to be Mexican or I'm too Mexican to be white. Where do I fit in? Is there a specific category for me? Why is it that when people first meet me, where are you from, are the first words said to me? Why is it that I'm treated differently when I respond to that question, acting as if I said the wrong answer? Labels should not matter. Who we are as people is what should matter. We should not be judged based on our nationalities, our sexual orientations, our income, what we look like, what we sound like. That does not represent who we are. Our, girl, our goals, our morals, our experiences, our accomplishments, our dreams, that is what should matter. One thing I want you to know about Mitzi and Joe is that both of them read things to me that I had never seen or heard of. They didn't develop these, they weren't for an assignment, but the habit and the um, development of this writing, like day after day of these quick writes that we did together, um, led them to do more than I expected. Here's Joe's. Next, I'm gonna show off a little poem. This one was the, uh, the Shake the Dust, and I did it off a hockey and lacrosse theme. So. This is for the locker room slave. This is for the fourth liners. This is for the star players. This is for the brick wall goalie. This is for the player that gets demolished in front of the whole fan section. Shake the dust. For the long car rides of torture, for the slip ups and forgetting your skates, for the kids who kept to themselves, who didn't go out to eat with the team. Shake the dust. This is for the reserves on the team, for the stud attackman. This is for the one handed player. This is for the deep hole with awful footwork. This is for the midi afraid to get a ground ball 
This is for the goalie who needed one more save. I'm just gonna cut his off there and say that um, the habit that Kelly and I believe is critically important is that students are in the habit of rereading this writing and working to make it a little bit better. So it isn't a matter of corrections, but a matter of rereading and thinking, do I have more to say here? Can I add something that um, makes this a more complete piece? And to have that as a habit, a regular habit of writing, even when you're not sure what you wanna say yet, of rereading it and making it a little bit better and not for a grade. The volume has to come first. I mean, I could teach every language arts standard that my system wants me to teach, but if the kids are not writing and writing and writing and writing, uh, they're never going to get to that level that we need them to be. So really, uh, really this idea of focusing on increasing volume of writing. And th this doesn't mean answer the teacher's four questions. It means kids generating their own thinking, telling their own, own stories and opinions. Um, so we thought at this point we would maybe shift uh, to the reading since we're halfway through um, and talk a little bit on the reading side. Uh, generally, we like to talk about what we're reading. What are you reading, Penny? Uh, everything I can. Um, this is a stack that's sitting next to me right now. And mostly because I know there's a gap in my understanding of Black history, of the multi layers of history that um, I never learned in school. And so I've been reading quite a bit that is educating me in the history of our country, um, as well as like anyone, some that is absolutely going to do no one any good in the world, except that I had a blast reading Bridgerton. Oh my God. I'm a big Jane Austen fan. So this is like modern Jane Austen. And yes, I'm in love. What are you reading, Kate, Kelly? Uh, so your balance there between serious and non-serious. Uh, <laughs> why fit don't exist uh, is, it's hard to categorize. It's a memoir. It's a history. It's also a call to creativity and seeing the world a little bit differently. Um, I recommend it very, very highly. My my Jerton is detective novel. So I was I found a new author, Louisa Lu, who uh, this book is called Two Girls Down. It's about two girls who are kidnapped, but I really like it because it has a very strong female. Uh, private investigator uh, who uh, who is the center of the story and is really really uh, compelling character. Yeah, I got to read this now. We try to remind kids and teachers that everyone lives a roller coaster reading life. They read hard books that challenge them, that are slower to read. They read vacation books that are just. A, I'm not going to ever you know, be a better person because I read The Duke and I, but I want to live in that world and somewhere in between. We also make our reading lives public for students. I just finished this. I'm currently reading this, what I will read next. And on my online classes um, this year, two or three book talks every single time I was on, um, I had to record these sessions and then um, meet with them in book clubs and writing groups. So this you know, the little book talks I did, they said it made a huge difference in what they wanted to read next. So, so if we're going to increase the volume of writing, we want to talk about increasing the volume of reading. And this could certainly be a six hour conversation. So uh, we're going to narrow into one area. Uh, in 180 days, we advocate that students have a, a much more balanced reading diet. Uh, which is, you know, a, a mixture of independent reading, book club reading, and core work reading. And given the fact uh, that we don't have a whole lot of time this evening, we thought we would zoom in and maybe talk about book clubs. It doesn't matter if it's an independent book or a, or a core work or uh, a book club book. If the kid doesn't pick it up, right? Um, it's yeah. not. It's not rich and. That reminds us of something Jason Reynolds, you were at a conference, Penny. Yeah, he talked about how he didn't read in high school. And so he took that into college and wasn't reading. His professor came up and said, you know, Jason, a bar reading's the only barbell you have for strengthening your mind. And that will change the way you move through the world, which made me think of Kylie Bears always said, you know, a book is like a barbell on the floor of the gym because it's it's not rigorous if, if you're not 
using it, right? That the rigor is in what the reader does with the text. And we all know that our students can pretend to read and go along in class and they're not doing very much work. They're just kind of listening in. And so how do we disrupt that pattern where some students want to kind of hitchhike along with other people's thinking? We really believe book clubs is one way to do that. So we're going to we know that you're doing a book study on 180 and you're going to see two, you're going to see this first book club in there that we did across the country with ninth graders from California, from the West coast to the East coast. We had selected a group of books um, and it asked kids to take a moment. They kind of tasted each of the books and then they decided which ones they were going to read. And then we grouped them across the continent around the central question of how do others in the world see things different than we do. I, we all know the value, of course, of having kids collaborate in small groups. You know, I could have kids collaborate all year long in small groups, but if the only kids they're collaborating with are other kids who live in the same neighborhood, they're really not going to get a view or they're not going to see the book differently. Kids who live in in the white mountains of Northern New Hampshire. And so we want our kids in a digital age, uh, we want kids in our classroom to connect with kids in the other classroom. And so that's what we did that first year uh, with the ninth grade book clubs. Uh, that is talked about in 100, 180 days. Uh, so we wanna talk about three generations of book clubs we've done since then. So uh, the second time we met, then we did it with scenes and we not only, we not only connected seniors, meaning 12th graders in the United States. We not only connected a Southern California, New Hampshire, but we added a third class of soon to be Englishers from the University of Miami, Miami University in Ohio. Uh, and uh, this was uh, 2017, I think the first year we did these because in the United States, there was a lot of uh, socially unjust things happening, still in our opinion. Uh, and so we selected books around the theme of social justice. Those on the top fiction, the on the bottom are nonfiction. There's a wide range of readability because in, even in a grade class, we have kids read a, a grade 12-ish level, but we also have kids in an eighth grade or ninth grade level. We want to offer a wide range of ability uh, for, for them to choose from. Uh, as we started across the country and with, with Ohio, we told them ahead of time this month that they were going to be pulling information and thinking from three different sources. One source would be the book on the, on the left column is the book that they're reading. In the middle column, though, during this month of study, we're also bringing in poems and, and videos about uh, inequity and social justice. And then on the right-hand side, we're connecting our kids through both Google Docs and Flipgrid so that they're having conversation across the country. We gave them the finish line question before we even began. And that is, you know, how did this reading experience change the way that you think about uh, issues uh, of social justice? So that was the second generation of book clubs. It's the third gen because we, uh, we tend to collaborate, but change it up every year. I think that's interesting, just that that's right. what I like to think. And so the next generation of book clubs, instead of a thematic approach, we decided that we were going to do an author study where we pick one author who writes across different mediums. Uh, Matt De La Pena has written a lot of young adult uh, novels that are to our teenagers. Uh, and, but he's also written children's picture books. He's all, also written short stories and essays. So we thought it would be fascinating to have our students read one author across different uh, of writing and to focus in on, on the craft moves um, that are similar and maybe different in some cases, depending on, on the, the genre that he's working in. In my class, we started with um, really looking at his picture books. These are my grade 12 students. Uh, and we're analyzing language moves. We're analyzing the of story. Go ahead and just go to those, Penny. Um, but in Penny's class, then those are my kids again. Penny's class didn't start with the with the with the children's book. They started with the novels. 
Yeah, just, I mean, this is my college class. So now we have these kids connected to seniors in high school, which mine, you know, are three months older than that. They enjoyed it. But we looked at, you know, how are we going to assess this idea of looking at writing craft across different mediums? What would that assessment look like? And Kelly's was um, connected to the theme of my course at the college, which is ghosts and other hauntings. So it's a freshman composition course, but it is has a theme and we study ghosts across New England and um, magical realism and spirits and all kinds of things. But I like the idea, you know, I like the idea that in all books, characters are haunted mm -hmm. or people who aren't characters, people who are in real life are haunted by decisions or things they did or things they didn't. So we kind of came at that angle. We model a lot of this kind of thinking like, okay, who haunted in your book? What's the character haunted by? But how does the author reveal this gets into author's craft and author's diction and, 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 and moves and techniques that authors employ that reveal this thing. Yeah, and in my class, um, we don't write literary analysis in first year composition. They write lots of essays and things, but not about books. So I said, you could write um, a fictional story that imitates the craft moves that Matt makes and then do footnotes to explain to me what's the craft move, where did you learn it um, in his work? Likewise, a short story in verse that would imitate the language of his um, picture books or a graphic novel or a podcast interview, really trying to get my students to demonstrate writing craft. Um, they interviewed Matt at one point at the end of this unit. So they had some of the idea of what an interview might sound like. So, you know, we kept him on track with um, a book club's checklist, which always helps kids, you know, know what's coming next. And then the biggest question is how do we get him to talk more? Right. And so one, we only, we only, both in high school and college, we give kids one month to read the book. We're not spending eight or nine weeks on a book because the book ceases to become a book at that point when it's chopped up into so many pieces. So basically, say you have four weeks to write it. And one way we get to think about how they might contribute to weekly conversations. So they go out and they read the first quarter of the book. And we might give them a question like, what's worth talking about? thus far in the book. The second week they've read half the book, we might ask them, what is a uh, name a big idea that is emerging? When they're three quarters of the way through the book, you know, name the writing craft moves that you've noticed, because that, that is the area of focus here. And then after they've read the book, how has this experience of reading and listening to others change your thinking, both about sort of the content and big ideas and themes of the book, but also about your thinking about the craft of writing. Absolutely. And, you know, we're going to spend about um, five more minutes talking about book clubs and then take your questions, which you can definitely put in the chat. Um, but in this case, this is one of my students. They loved bringing their thinking to class and that gave them a way to talk. So when they walked in the room, it wasn't just what are we going to say about the book, but we asked them to, you know, collect passages and your thinking. Um, these kids are all reading I Will Save You. Their notebooks look very different because what we asked them to do was collect things that interested them, that they thought they had more to say about. What would they say in class? You can see the guiding questions up there at the top, but the student has decided to take notes on all kinds of things that could contribute to what's happening um, in the book. And another student from my class who made those notes on post-it notes as she read, and then kind of categorized them um, before she came to class, the student highlighting what she wanted to talk about. So even though the kids are very different and their um, two page spreads, we call them, are very different, they're coming to class prepared that when they arrive, they're gonna have a chance to share those with each other and then have conversations about what's happening in their book. It's a big idea. We ask kids to bring two, two pages of their own thinking to the discussion each week. They're not answering our questions. They're we have some focus questions, but as you see, most of the kids are picking where they wanna go uh, and generating their own thinking in different ways. And we have them talking online to each other because our kids, you know, they're curious about what are these kids in California like? And California kids are curious about New Hampshire. We don't know that our students would ever visit. So so here's Andrew. And I don't know that we have to show the entire video, but we'll show the first few parts. This is one of my students, Andrew. 
Um, hello, my name is Andrew Hernandez, and uh, I'm from Anaheim, California. Uh, I'm in Mr. Gallagher's second period class, and I just want to talk about um, the book that I'm reading called Mexican White Boy. Um, this is a great book, actually. Um, I really enjoy uh, Matt de la Pena's art of, um, of writing and um, the way he explains the novel in like his, um, in, like, his sort of words. Um, Um, to be honest, it's like a really good book. It's a mix of two different cultures of American and Mexican. So Mexican white boy really uh, intrigued me because I'm actually half white, half Mexican. So um, it was just like a godsend to me, but um, I really enjoyed it. But a godsend to me. It was a godsend to me. And then what what he goes on to do in that video is he asks questions of other people. So I didn't get this one part. what did you guys think about X? And yeah. now he's in response. And now we have kids talking from across the country to one another. Sorry, I cut that off thinking that's where you wanted me to. No, that's, that's fine. And so when we did this, a study of Matt de la Pena got us to think about what other authors might we do this kind of work with and uh, having kids gather around and look at their craft. And we've tried to pick authors who write different genres. Right, across, you know, from poetry to picture books, to short stories, to um, even TED Talks. And, you know, We Are All Feminists as an essay. And how can we take the idea of, you know, writers are flexible. They can write across genre to, um, publish commentary and reviews of other books to write nonfiction, to write short stories. So, you know, I think there's a lot here in author study. Um, but this year, and just a couple minutes to explain that, you know, I had to consider the fact that I didn't have 180 days. I only had 26 because the university cut our semester short um, because of COVID. And so I thought I would just say that one thing that changed is I put book clubs first thing at the start of the year. And what I did was give students nine titles and ask them to choose two. And so they would read the first book in the first four weeks of the semester, and the second book in the second four weeks. And then we would look together at what kinds of things connected those books because these all have haunted characters they have characters haunted by something or there's actually a magical realism or a spirit in the book. And six of these books explicitly deal with race, which is something I think we have to um, have our students talking about. And every one of my students chose one of these books from National Book Award winners to YA to um, novels in verse. So in the end, what I asked my students to do was to generate a question that could connect the two books. And I have kept track of what some of the questions were that they came up with. Now that you've read both of them, um, one student said, well, both of my characters, uh, both books have a character who's running from something. And I'm wondering if we're all running from something, right? Um, what's the power of a mentor on your actions? Does intelligence have an impact on behavior? How does being haunted, and this is a student who actually has a ghost sitting on the end of her bed, impact your mental health? Look at this one. In both of my books, the characters seem to have forgotten how much other people in their lives depend on them. I want to explore who will miss you across both books. Wow. So in my class, they had to create a digital composition to bring those ideas together. And I showed them that there are a lot of decisions that they would have to make as writers, creators in this medium of digital composition. How do you decide what to include to show what your two books were about? So they created storyboards for their ideas and eventually a composition. I'm just gonna show you the first about 40 seconds of this. Every person is a book with chapters, and those final chapters differ, whether it's long and satisfying, or abrupt, unwarranted, and unfair. Loss is ever-present in everyone's life, 
and it drives our actions after tragedy. Will, a boy on his long way down to destruction. So I'm sorry, but I have to cut that off because we want to get to um, your thinking. But my students um, wrote endnotes, and what I noticed more than anything was their commitment to revision. Something about a digital medium and its kind of intoxicating beauty as you, as you plate these um, images and this music and all of your voiceover, you put it all together, kept them working at it. And as Joe said, um, he wanted to be sure that others could follow his thought process easily. So we watched it and he watched it and he watched it. And that idea of practice in revision and in thinking, like, can somebody follow me is something I want them to carry into their essays. So as Avery said, another student in the class, since they didn't have rules about this work, it forced them to be creative. It forced them to do more work. She said it was easier when I knew exactly what the requirements were, but because digital composition was so open, it drove them to different thinking. So I leave you with that because the book that we just finished writing is all about decision-making and giving kids more um, time to do that work. And I think it's a, it's a critical turn in the work we do. So and with that, one, important, one important chapter in that book is this idea that, you know, if kids have been writing and writing and writing and writing all year, yeah. why not find something there that could be told digitally that did composition, it's time that that's, that's uh, something that should be in, in the middle of the curriculum, that composition is composition, revision is revision. And if they're more likely to learn revision and, and stick stick to itiveness with digital, that's the world we should be um, aiming for more often. Yeah, so it's interesting um, that I was writing about Julius now that he's jamming himself at <laughs> the door because he wants in. Um, you must know that we're winding up here, but I noticed one of the questions in the chat box is, um, is it possible to do book clubs with a shorter time frame, say, 20 days? And I would say yes, because my other option is um, trying to connect all kids to books and independent reading, which is going to be harder with 20 days, or doing just one um, core text and trying to get all kids to want to read the same book. I don't know. What do you think, Kelly? I agree, but it depends on the kids and it depends on the books that you have access to. Yeah, that's true too. Right. Yeah. So it depends. It's hard to answer without knowing you know, what books you have access to and, and, but, but for sure, I think, you know, there are kids, we, we have, we've had lots of kids and pick the most challenging books. Mm -hmm. We'll finish in two weeks and wait for the rest of their group to, to catch up to them. So yeah. certainly possible. you had well, a rain. Catherine uh, mentioned uh, we video. Didn't you use we video to make digital yeah. work in your room? We did a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an e it's free. I just always Google best software programs, free movie making programs, and my students mm -hmm. pick one. So, Aaron, did you come up with any other questions? Did they come in and I missed them? We do. We had questions that were submitted in advance. Ah. Um, but there is one because you acknowledged. Um, how there's a wide um, variety of readability in the classroom. And that's something we're really looking and acknowledging and addressing with reading intervention programs as well in the secondary panel is that we assume that teachers, like when students come to a grade 10 class, they're reading at a grade 10 level, but we now know that there's this wide variety of readers. So um, thank you for acknowledging that. Um, my question then is, how do you go about choosing core texts where everyone's uh, reading the same book with that understanding that there's a variety of uh, readers in the classroom? How do you, how do you bridge um, those reading gaps? Oh, well, that's a little question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the deeper I get in my career, the, the idea that one size fits all on any one book is really problematic. Uh, so I do think there is a value in three kids read a book and talk about it and argue about it. 
uh, that doesn't necessarily happen when four kids read a book. Uh, to, to bridge that gap, we have to do tons, I have to do tons, uh, like let's say when Penny and Tommy and Juliet together. So I, I gave my kids No Fear Shakespeare where it was translated. I gave my kids audio recordings. We watched film, we watched, we didn't just say you're Romeo, you're Juliet, now reading. We did a lot of intervention, a lot of tape, a lot of uh, uh, translation and helping kids through that text. And even in a, 12, a grade 12 class where my kids are reading 1984, I give them chapter summaries, some of them, because some of them, the book uh, is too hard without that level of support, without audio books. Um, so uh, having scaffold is, is a really challenging thing. Penny? Yeah, I was thinking about all the interventions I used to help kids who were struggling with the text. Like we read um, The Absolute True Diary of a Part-Time Indian as the second core text when we were teaching 180 Days. And I can remember a kid that would come to me and I would read part of it out loud to him because he was really struggling with hearing the text and understanding the text. And we got the audio version, which he was using. But um, anytime the text is far above their fluency level, students get unmotivated very quickly. So that's why it becomes such a challenge. And we found that book clubs, um, students self-selected. So sometimes they chose a text and we'd be like, ooh, that feels like that's too hard for that kid. But they would then endeavor to, re I mean, there was just this, like if they wanted to read it, their effort to read it was very different than if it was a core text and I wanted them to read it. And that raises the readability and how do you measure readability too. Readability is a very tricky thing. A, a lot of things, you know, I, I would, if I back up just a second, is that one size fits all is becoming increasingly problematic as that reading gap between kids is why, which is why, uh, you know, years ago, we do eight core works. And when we wrote 100 and we did two, one, one in the first half of the year and one in the second half of the year, and that 80% of the rest of the reading was some sort of student selection, either partial selection by picking some book or 100% choice by picking a book. Yeah. And I would the say I didn't have very many kids who read eight books or fewer. They read way more than oh, yeah. the old march through cortex kind of approach. But read a bit also, especially with older kids, is, is really on prior knowledge, on factors that are outside the book as well. It's not just, it's not just uh, the syntax of the book or the level of vocabulary in the book. It's all prior knowledge and background. It's also uh, motivation as well. So it's a key it, thing to say, you know, I don't, I'm a reader. I have a readability. I have many readabilities depending on if you give me that detective Muller book on baseball, I'm going to read it very quickly. But if you give electrical engineering guide, ability is very problematic. So any book selected for class is going to be problematic for some kids. So how do you scaffold it? Yeah, that's such a big question. And, you know, I guess we would like to say at this point that um, we know some of you have family obligations and need to get off. We had told Aaron we'll stay for you know a few more minutes and talk about questions, but we wouldn't be offended at all if you need to leave. But I would like to say one more thing before you do, and that is that until March uh, 15th, you can apply for a grant from the Book Love Foundation, which um, gave 15 grants to Canadian teachers this last year, which was lovely. And we would love to have more uh, applications from your area, your board. So uh, bookloffoundation.org backslash apply and check out our application because um, we give away thousands of books and thousands of dollars to teacher every year. And, and Penny, just want to let you know that Tara's on, on the line here, our Tara Sword. Um, she is uh, one of our teachers who received your... Um... That's so great. Hi, yeah. Tara. <laughs> that's awesome. So um, we'll stay around and continue with questions if that's okay for... Um, Teachers and those who need to go are happy to go. But I did have a question about using notebooks um, online. And we just was talking with Alicia a little bit about um, the idea of having kids write in Google Slides or something like that. And I was writing back that I would let them write privately so that they share only if they choose to. Because my students often would find 
that in quick writing, it might take them somewhere that's hard to share. Like I imagine, I was thinking of yours, Kelly, like you might not have been ready to share tonight the actual notebooks that you wrote about your dad. Right. And, you know, I was in the classroom when the pandemic hit in the last couple of months of school there and I would write every day, every single day, every day. And then when once we got to a certain point where they had enough writing under their belt, they would take a photograph of the one that they would want with me. So they would write eight entries, but they would share one with me. Yeah. And that I, I think that guarantees their level of privacy. It guarantees have a safe place to take risks uh, and to, you know, explore where the writing might take. It's not performative. It's, it's really, um, I want to write today. Yeah. Yeah, my writing was pretty bad today. I wouldn't have wanted to share it <laughs> until I got to work on it a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you. We've had. Go just ahead. want to say we've had lots of uh, wonderful tweets. So I know you're both on on Twitter. So it's hashtag OCSB 180 days. If you want to go back and read through um, some of the comments that people have been um, sharing and insights that they've had. Uh, again, just looking at the um, the different things that have been picked up on uh, the quick writing the idea to let go of some of the parameters so, so creativity can flow. Um, uh, Laurel's uh, young daughter actually did the writing with her <laughs> sitting beside her tonight. So you've inspired a, a new generation of writers I as love well. That. <laughs> love that. And, and just uh, a lot of uh, wonderful uh, excitement. So th thank you so much for joining us. Did we want to do one last question, Aaron? And, uh, I, I asked mine. I wanted to give you the opportunity to ask one or pick one from the okay. list if you wanted to. Yeah. Sure. So um, and there was a couple of questions from new teachers, and I have new teachers on here as well. And and um, I know hey, I teachers. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> and so um, you know we're as new teachers, we want to stick with the curriculum. We want to do what we're supposed to do and get it covered. And um, our new teachers are under two evaluations in the first year. But how do we sort of let go of, of some of those things to teach the student where they're at? Well, I think that's a pretty hard question to, to ask a, for, of a new teacher. You know, like you just laid out, when I was a new teacher, I unfortunately did not know there was a curriculum. I was teaching third grade and never got the books and just kind of made it up. And my principal was horrified when I confessed to that in June, um, but I didn't know. And I had a great time figuring it out, but a new teacher today is gonna be handed a lot to do. And I just can't imagine telling that new teacher, um, just do whatever you want. So I think there are particular, I think you wanna make the curriculum as um, connected to the real lives of kids as you can. But if you are given eight core texts to teach, that's going to make igniting a real interest in reading hard. So what would you say? I think, I think it's an invitation to have these conversations department. I think it's an invitation to try to, as a teacher, this thing I did was shoulder up with a veteran teacher, still enthusiastic, still loved his job uh, and got under his wing and really, uh, he said, well, you could ignore this, but you better do that. Um, and to somebody who knows the system and knows the ropes. The issue, of course, is that sometimes teachers are handed things by, well, often teachers are handed things that are, that are by people who have never met your kids. And so, um, Penny are more of the school of slow down and go deeper and deeper rather than trying to cover. It, I'll say again, you could cover every standard. If your kids aren't reading and writing a lot, it's not gonna matter. So that that's a real tension that I think new teachers feel. And I would suggest you know, trying to shoulder up with somebody to, to navigate that minefield. Yeah. And I think it, yeah, if we back it up and we look at what the purpose of education is, it's it, our students are the curriculum really, right? And so mm -hmm. how can we, um, enhance that. So. Well, 
Yeah, that's that's a great point, Allison. I mean, you're, we teach kids first and teach curriculum second, right? The kids are the curriculum, right? And so if somebody hands you something that's too hard for your kids to do, you have to meet your kids where they are. If the pacing guide says that on this day, you should be here, but the kids they wrote crummy introductions to their essays yesterday. You got to go back and revisit that. You got to go back and meet them where they are. The curriculum needs to be responsive to the children who are in the room. Yeah, I was thinking about like, didn't you learn your best lessons in my first views of teaching when I would listen to what was happening and like, you guys, we should talk about this and bring the whole class together or the stuff that wasn't scripted or that was very spontaneous mm -hmm. and allowed the community of the class to come together. I took my guitar to class every day and I was always playing music. We were singing along. They were eight, right? So a little different, but <laughs> this idea that that's how you become a teacher is when you're doing it in the moment, not just following. So forget that. I need video of you singing in your classroom and I need it. <laughs> in the the eight-year-olds. <laughs> that's right. Luckily it doesn't exist. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'd like to also say that we really hope, of course, that this pandemic gets behind us sooner than later. And I know I'm speaking because Penny and I have had this conversation. We would love nothing more to come back to capital Canada, beautiful Ottawa, and really side by side with the teachers there working in Canada. So thank you so much for having us tonight. It was a treat for us. Absolutely. And to get you back, maybe that'll happen with the new book that's coming out. Yeah. <laughs> Comes out coming out of the fall. So yeah. let, let's talk. Let's talk calendar because our kids are starting to happen again. We, yeah. So we can expect a new book, which I understand is kind of an extension, maybe more of a deeper dive of 180 days. We can expect to see that in the fall. Yeah, yes. it's, you know, it's four units that we think are just really important. These studies of different things in teaching um, that we think are just really important for teachers to think about. So we spent a lot of time developing what it is that's most important to us. Okay. Well, we look forward to that. Um, and again, I just reiterate what Allison said. Thank you. The comments are what a great opening session to the book club. You've given us so much to think about, and we are going to take these points and dive deeper over the next three sessions um, with teachers. So thank you both for taking the time in these challenging times from all over the country uh, to be here with us tonight. This is uh, such a blessing and a gift to have you uh, join us and, and continue to lead the way for teachers in literacy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all, everybody. Bye, well, stay safe. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Mm.